I am the editor of Vetenskapens Värld. Vetenskapens Värld is uh, the oldest science program in Swedish television. It's one of the oldest television programs at all in Sweden. It's 30 years old. So it has a, a genuine and long history and we have a very many viewers. To be such a narrow subject, we have about half a million viewers um, every Monday night, which is very good for science television these days. Um, and um, I've been working for this program for since 2001. Uh, before that I did uh, science television for children. Uh, and also I do some work for news media, for Rapporten Aktuellt, which are the biggest news programs in Sweden. So I hope that after my presentation, after this hour, you will have insights somehow in the life in the media newsroom and in uh, science television as well. Uh, and I also hope that after we're done here, you will have some answers to this idea about journalists mm -hmm. that many of you have, I think. <laughs> Why are journalists always in a hurry? Why are we so sloppy all the time? And how come that science journalists are so illiterate and uneducated and don't even know anything about molecular biology? Those are one of the things that I, ho I hope that when you go from this lecture or from this meeting, uh, you're going to have an answer to that. Uh, I have brought some clips and I have this presentation. Um, my clips, unfortunately, are in Swedish. Um, but I think you're going to get a general idea, at least, about a little bit about our work. Um, what I was, I, I was thinking about what is my biggest problem when I handle scientists, which I do all the time. Why does it sometimes become tr trouble? Why, why don't we always get along? And I think one important aspect is that we don't know m enough about each other's everyday life. You don't understand mine and I don't understand yours. I think that after working for science television for such a long time as I've been doing now, I think I have a general understanding, but many of my reporters don't. They don't understand the life of the scientists, and usually the scientists don't understand why we're always in a hurry, for example. And uh, uh, you should ask yourself, when a journalist is calling you, uh, as a scientist or as a communicator, why are they calling? In what role are they calling? Uh, because there are several different kinds. Uh, one, which is the best one, I think, if, if you want your uh, story out, if, it's a, if they're calling you to report. Um, you heard about something, somebody has a new experiment out or a new study, and the reporter wants to report about that. That is one type of call. If you get a call like that, you can't really go wrong. It's the best kind you can get. Uh, because then, all you can do is to be open about your research, maybe practice a little bit on how to talk about your research. All uh, scientists want a call like that. The second call that you might get uh, is not as pleasant, I think. Uh, sometimes investigative reporters will call you if you do something wrong. Sometimes you don't even know that you are doing something wrong, but usually when you get the second call kind of call, it is a different kind. And Usually, when an investigative reporter calls, they already know. So a very bad idea, if you get that kind of call, is to try to hide the facts or be unpleasant and say, well, I don't know anything about that. Because the reporter, when they're calling in that kind of manner, they already know. So it's the best thing you can do if you get the second kind of call, which, which is not the great one, is to just actually talk about why did you do as you do, did? Do not volunteer a lot of information because you don't have to give them more than they have. But it's a very bad idea to not respond, for example, or to be very aggressive and say, why, 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 do, why are you calling me? Because for the viewers, if you do that on camera, or even if the journalist is really wrong and bad, and what the viewers is going to see is a very angry scientist on television, and they don't know anything about the background. They're just going to see you being very aggressive. And that happens a lot, and it's a big mistake to do. So if you do get a second call, try to behave as if it was the first one, uh, but do not volunteer information. That is my advice <laughs> on that. 
<laughs> the third one uh, is a call that I don't think many of you think about. Sometimes we, the science journalists especially, are the experts. Journalists like to interview each other, uh, usually because if, if you take in a scientist and put them in, for example, as you saw on the clip, uh, a sofa and you're going to talk about news, sometimes the scientist talks forever and nobody understands. But if you, if you bring in another reporter, you know a little bit how they're going to behave, which is good for, for a television program, program like that. And every time I'm supposed to participate in another program, being an expert, I need to call a different, a whole lot of scientists to know what I'm talking about. And that kind of call is very important for the science, for me, and also for the program. Sometimes scientists say, why, why should I help you with this? What's in it for me? And I think you should ask yourself instead, how can I help? Because you do want to get when people talk about science, you want it to be correct. And the best way for it to be correct is for you to help out. Even if your name is never mentioned in the story, it's a good thing to do. And it's also a good thing to do because uh, next time the journalist calls and need to talk to somebody about the story that you want to get out, you are known by the media. So the journalists know about you, and maybe the next time it will be about your story. So it's a good thing for you. And the third reason why you should participate in this fact-checking type of thing uh, is that it should be right, but it's also it's your responsibility. Uh, in Sweden, I'm not sure if that is a European uh, agreement, but in Sweden we have something called the third assignment. It is really your job to bring science and research out to the general audience. And even if your name is never mentioned, it's still your job. Um, I have had many discussions with people uh, throughout the years, fewer than what you would expect, but sometimes, every now and then, people say, what's in it for me? Well, what's in it for you is it's your job. It's your job to explain science to the general audience. It's going to bring more people to Karolinska Institute, to all kinds of science education, so even if, if you don't get any, nobody says, well, this is what he said or, or t talks about your institute, it's still good for science to participate even in that role. Uh, I'm going to move back now to the first three questions or the first three statements that I made in the beginning uh, that journalists are, are always in a hurry, they are sloppy, and they are uneducated. Uh, and first of all, is it true? Are we always in a hurry? And the question, to the, uh, the, the question is rather easy to answer. Yes, we are. Journalists are always in a hurry. That kind of goes with the territory. Journalist comes from the world day, and that means today. Not tomorrow, not the next week, not in three months, today. Uh, and that is a really important thing for scientists to understand, because I think that could maybe be the biggest problem I have when I communicate with scientists. Uh, as the editor of a, new, a science program, as I am right now, uh, sometimes we have a month, sometimes we have three months, uh, but there is always a deadline. And when you pass that deadline, really you can't do anything. And for news reporters, it's not a matter of a week, it's not a matter of three days, it's a matter of one day. Uh, and I figured that when I was a news reporter, uh, Maybe it will help you to just see what a day of a news reporter could be like. Uh, because when you, as scientists and communicators, get a call from a research uh, reporter, uh, you should look at your watch and think about where is this reporter now in his or her work. Uh, so this is a typical day. Uh, you get to work at 9 a.m. Before that, you're supposed to have read the major newspapers, listened to radio, uh, and have a general good idea about what's going on today. So you meet at 9 a.m. At 9 a.m., somebody has been there before you, who has been there for working for two hours, and decided what are the most important st uh, stories of the day. And if you don't have your own story, mo many, many science journalists work their own schedule, but if you don't, if something happened, this is the time you get your assignment. So at 9 a.m., uh, you meet, and at 9.30 you have your assignment. Uh, and 
then you have approximately, if you're, if you're lucky, you have two hours to figure out what is this story about? What about this Tommy Flew thing? What is that? Who should I talk to? Where should I interview that person? Uh, all that should be decided before lunch, because otherwise you are in trouble as a journalist, especially here in Stockholm where it takes you to drive from Tevehuset, which is on the other side of town, to just come here it takes you about 20 minutes. And if you don't know what the people that you're going to interview, if you don't know who they are and where they are at that hour, you're going to have a really difficult time to get through. So if you get a call in the morning, that's good, because somebody has chosen you to be the lead character in their story, and it's probably one of those calls the investigative journalists don't, do, don't call at that hour. <coughs> it's the one that wants to report about your research, that wants you to be an expert. So if somebody calls you around 9 or 10, it's really good for you. So then you say, yes, and we can do this interview at 11. Then the journalist will be very happy. Uh, because between 11 and 3 is the time that we gather everything that's going to be in the story. And if you noticed, for example, the story with Akira, uh, there's, uh, first of all, there's pictures of him. There's an interview. Uh, there's also some graphics that you can see now that uh, I had ordered at 9, 9.30 I went to our graphics department and ordered the graphics so they could make that while I was away filming. You have very limited time. So the quicker you are, the better the story is. Uh, and then when you get back to the newsroom, which is around 3, then you have, if you're lucky, uh, you have um, one or two hours to prepare the story and to edit. At that point you sometimes realize, I really don't understand this story. That happens every now and then. If you get a call at 3 o'clock, it's usually a journalist who, who realizes that, oh my god, I really don't know, maybe this is wrong. So that is a fact check call. And then you should answer immediately if you can. And if you have any, for example, if you, if you don't agree with the Tommy Flu story, that's the time to say that. You don't call back the next day and say, well, when I was thinking about it, I thought maybe I should have said that. Well. The story broadcast tonight. Our deadline is never after 7, because our major news, news program is 7.30. So this is, I think, something that, for scientists, this is kind of hard to gasp sometimes, that we really <coughs> are in a hurry. It's not that we're just trying to stress you out. Very often we, we work against the clock. We start in the morning and we keep running. We very seldom have lunch, because those... Every, every hour you lose is an hour less in the edit, uh, editing room. And the editing is the whole trick to get the story good. Uh, Sometimes if it's breaking news, something happens at 4 o'clock, then the whole schedule moves forward and you have to do everything even quicker. Uh, so that is why journalists are always in a hurry, because they are. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a, usually a good thing to call back immediately, because otherwise it's too late, uh, if it's possible with your schedule. Uh, yeah. <coughs> then the second part, then. Uh, the sloppiness. And also the third one about the Ill, uh, uneducated journalists. Sometimes I think that is one of the, also a big misconception because um, journalists are not sloppy by nature. Uh, journalists are usually the worst thing for a journalist is to be wrong, because then you have to come back the next day and correct it, and it's very, very embarrassing to do that in, in a news program. So journalists are not sloppy, they just have a different way of being accurate than what you think is accurate. Uh, I often, when I write my scripts, uh, I often try to make them sound like I have not written them, like I'm speaking. So I always write in a speaking manner. Very often I get back, sometimes I have the time to fact check, check in this schedule, and I send my script to a researcher, and I'm not sure how many times I've gotten the script back with somebody make, make, making red marks, say, well, that is wrong spelled, and you should say the, the sentence in this way instead of that. And that is not sloppiness. That is the whole clue. That is the whole trick. You, you, sometimes people are afraid of science. They think th science is very difficult. If you try to speak about science 
in an easygoing manner, you're going to get a much bigger audience to understand. And that is our field of expertise. It's not sloppiness. We do it on purpose. Most of us do it on purpose. What we need help with is fact-checking. Sometimes we get that wrong. As you can see on the clip with my, my everyday life, sometimes it's too many things to keep in mind. So then we miss the facts. And that is unfortunate, and that's where you can help out. But we're not sloppy. Uh, we're doing our best, but our best is not the same as the scientists' best. Um, and about uneducation, being uneducated, very often uh, when I meet new scientists, they start asking me, what kind of scientific background do you have? And I always answer, none, which is not completely true, but it's a good thing for them to believe. Because <laughs> my ex field of expertise is not science. My field of expertise is television journalist. And I am, I wouldn't say I'm a star in that, but I've been doing that for 20 years. And that's what I know how to do. So it's not a very, it's not one of the best questions you can ask. What is your scientific background? I, on my staff, I have a physicist, I have a geologist. But they are also uh, journalists. Their major field of expertise is not their own science background. I have them because they're good journalists. And we are constantly looking for people that have science background. It's not, it's not bad to have a science background, but it's not necessary. For us, the major thing is that you should understand how science works, and that you can learn. Uh, and we are not uneducated. Some of us do have a science background, some, some don't. But what we do have is a journalistic background, and we know how to evaluate facts. Uh, and my science reporters have more than just ordinary reporters. They know a little bit more. And what do they know? What do a science reporter know? What can you expect a good science reporter to know when they're calling you? Uh, or, or when you want to feed them a story, what can you expect? them to understand. Uh, well, one is uh, how to read a science article, uh, which for you who works as scientists sounds ridiculous. Of course, anyone could read, could read a scientific report. No, uh, it, it's, it's rather difficult to understand what are the important stuff here. Uh, the abstract, the lead author, the references, a science reporter should know that. Uh, and a science reporter, a Swedish television, knows that. Uh, and what more do, do a science reporter know? Well, they know how to differ between good and poor studies. At least they should know. Many ordinary news media journalists don't know that. So if you have a real poor story to feed to someone, call someone at a small newspaper uh, who has a lot of things to do, because then you can get through a story that that have five people being studied, uh, that have uh, maybe that you, you didn't have any control group, uh, maybe that uh, you put somebody who has lowest rank to do the whole story by them, uh, the whole study by themselves. To get the story like that through, it's a good idea to call someone who has no time to fact check. Then you can, of course, ask yourself, what's the purpose of doing that? That's another story, but, but my reporters know this stuff. So don't be surprised if, if you try to feed them a story and they will call you back and say, well, it's just only eight people here being interviewed. Why is that? Uh, a science reporter should know that. And another important thing is, I hope this is correctly translated, causation or correlation. Is that correct in English? Yeah, that is, in my opinion, I now talk a lot about how you can go wrong. For us as science reporters and as reporters in general, this is our most common mistake. There are so many news stories that have correlation but not causation that sometimes to, if, if, do people that eat, drink three cups of coffee a day live longer? Is it, is, do they live longer because of the coffee that they drank or is there something else? Could it be like people that can afford coffee many times a day might have a better way of life in general? 
very often you can see this unfortunate misunderstanding among journalists. Uh, my, my science reporters hopefully never makes this mistake, but you see it every day in the news media. And I think you as scientists has a responsibility there to briefly, if you, if you realize that the person calling you do not know this, explain it. Explain it and say, well, you don't know this. It is a, it is a correlation, not a causation. Uh, because this so very often is wrong. Wouldn't you agree? Every time you see, uh, uh, what do you call it, Löpsedel, uh, headlines, it's very often a mistake made here. And I think that's one of the re important things for us to handle. Um, and then, of course, this call a second source. Uh, you might be the second source. Uh, you don't call only the person who did the stud study to ask if it was a good study. Uh, and if somebody calls you and says, is this a good story, say no if it isn't. Uh, because it will help and we won't get any wrong reporting. So uh, I will end by uh, giving you a few examples on how to get in the media in a way you don't want to be in the media or how not to get in the media when you really want your story out. And all of these examples are things that happened to me. Uh, that in my contact with scientists, this is what usually <coughs> goes wrong. I've been talking a bit about uh, some of them, uh, but I will just run through this uh, to, to end uh, so you can get a <laughs> rehearsal of it. Uh, the first one, be too slow. I will call you back tomorrow. I will read through your script and then maybe get back in three weeks. Or, I don't have time because I need to go to the gym right now, but in two hours I will be back. Mm. Uh, very common mistake. Demand to see the full story before broadcast. That happens to me almost every day. And if you do that, you saw the schedule. You have, I have maybe one hour from when I'm done with the story to when it's supposed to go on air. If somebody demands to see the full story before broadcast, that means that person has to come with me and sit next to me for the rest of the day, just to make sure that it can really be done. I cannot promise this. Sometimes people ask, can I? And if, if it's really important, I can call you and you can kind of listen on the phone, but it's really difficult. What you should do instead is say, could you call me when you have your script ready so I can fact check? That is a different matter. That you can do. It takes hardly five minutes. But to see the full story, that means that you kind of lock the journalist in a sense that what if you don't like the story? Should they re-edit it at seven o'clock, 20 minutes before broadcast? It's, it's a very difficult thing to do. And you should not do that. You should not uh, d demand to see it. You could say, well, it would be interesting to see. And sometimes for our news, uh, for our science program, which is very, you have a long producing time, uh, then you can ask, could I maybe see the story? But to put that as a condition is a really bad idea. And this one. Uh, <laughs> It kind of go, comes back to the whole idea about do not start lecturing uh, or do not start questioning, cross-examining the journalist about, well, what is your science background? Don't you even know what mitochondrial DNA is? What kind of education do you have? Those are not, that happens a lot. It's like, how can you be the editor of the biggest science program in Sweden and you don't even know what this is? And then it's a really tiny thing. Uh, and, <laughs> It's, you could think about that. I think sometimes when I speak to people, I think, oh my God, they don't know anything. But you don't say that. <laughs> because that will put you, the journalist will be very angry and you will get a, a, a worse story. And, and it is better for you to be nice and not superior. And uh, journalists are not your students. You should not be su superior to your students either, but absolutely not to journalists, because that is a completely different field of expertise that need their respect. Especially, I have a young reporter now who was in Gothenburg yesterday, and uh, she filmed a professor who treated her really bad. Why? Why do you do that? 
Uh, what's what? I can't understand that. It's good for him. He gets his research out. Mm. It's good for everyone. She is new. Be nice. Uh, another thing, I I'm not very good at this uh, subject. It's I know a little bit about diabetes, but there's a lot of people that knows more. Call five other people instead. Think about the schedule. Do we have time to call five people? No. Uh, so if if it's something to, that you might be able to answer, do not recommend somebody else, especially not if you're a woman. That happens all the time. That when I call uh, somebody, I, I look through and I find, well, I think I should ask her. There's always, well, I do have a professor who's better than me in this field. Says who? Maybe you are the best one to present this. Ask yourself, can I? And if you have any reason to believe that you can, do not recommend a colleague. Do it yourself. So, and just a special thing to all you younger women, because that happens a lot, that why do we always see men, older men in television? Because they have the courage to say yes. And that takes a lifetime to get that, but why not? Why not try it? Um, and then, well, I wasn't the only person who did this story. It was 12 of us, and you really have to mention the other 12, and one of them was from Brussels, so you need to mention their institute as well. And now when you're at it, maybe it could be possible if you could kind of explain that it's a cooperation between two different research organizations, but they're not completely cooperation. It's, it's like one is 20% and one is 80. Is, is that possible to get in a story? No, it's not. <laughs> and then the, this one is also a very ir irritating one. Sometimes when I do have the time to fact check, I send my script to someone and said, well, that's an interesting script, but uh, it would be much better if you started in the other end. Maybe you could kind of like, I don't know, I've written a few articles myself, and I kind of like to start with this one instead. That is not your job. Uh, and usually it's just very irritating. If, if you're in a hurry, or even if you're not in a hurry, you want to tell the story your own way. You can suggest and maybe do it a little bit smarter, but to write a completely new script and kind of try to persuade the reporter to do that instead never works. Journalists get very angry when you do that. Do not. <laughs> And here's the one that I talked about earlier. There's never... I act the same way. When I'm being questioned and people don't believe what I'm saying, the first feeling is you get very angry. Wait until that first feeling kind of fades away. Then you call back. Because aggression is very bad on television. And it's bad for you, even if you're right. Because aggressive people look very nasty. You don't want to look like that on television. And... Here is the last one. Uh, we understand that it's important and very difficult what you're doing, but it never helps to try to explain it in scientific details, tales. Uh, you should speak as if you're talking to your neighbor or whoever, but do not use the same language as you do when you do the study in itself. So, this is my uh, list of things that I think, from our point of view, the communication would work better if you look at this list. I'm sure that you can make a list exactly the same for me, <laughs> and I look forward to that you all email me that story. <laughs> but uh, uh, these are things that I've been thinking about during my uh, contacts with scientists. Uh, do anyone have questions, or is there anything else you would comment on? Or yes. Could I ask you? You said nine thirty in the morning. Do you have your own your assignment? Is somebody else telling you who you should go to? Usually not. It, it depends. Uh, I am the one who some who gives out assignments a lot. Uh, yes, since I'm I'm the editor as well. I have both positions. When I'm the editor, if I have a new reporter. Uh, I usually give them like a hint, like this person is, I know this person is good, maybe you should call him or her or ask. Uh, if there is um, a little bit more experienced science 
reporter, it's usually better to not give a name because you might come up with someone that hasn't been used 2,000 times before. Um, but it depends a little bit about the seniority of the reporter that gets the assignment. Hmm? I have a comment. And, and from your uh, presentation now, the, the impression that I get is that you have had a very, very bad experience with scientists. I mean, that's what comes out from with you speaking now, is all the negative things. And I think in, in general, like the asking about your background is something that is not a matter of being trying to be superior. Of course, there are definitely assholes, but if, if you ask somebody, I mean, in general, if I would ask, it's just that, how, how do I put the words right so I can get the message through? It's not about putting somebody down. It's more, of, do I explain um, chromatin modifications or DNA as like a, a cookbook uh, where you're trying to make recipes? I mean, it's how you put, uh, how you try to explain something. So, I mean, if I talk to somebody who was a student of mine, or if I talk to my sister, I have to find out how, how the best I can sort of describe what I'm doing, which is obviously if I'm just talking about what I did for my thesis, it's just crazy words that nobody would understand unless I try to translate it into something <coughs> that a, a, a normal person would understand. And it's not about being smart or not smart, it's about whether you have spent four or ten years with those words that you can't even translate into Swedish or not. I mean, it's not. I mean, in general, uh, yeah. I don't think that <laughs> I don't think that most scientists are bad. And if you recommend a colleague, it's usually a sort of more of being humble and, and feeling that maybe I'm not the best person for this. And as a, like, especially if you're a younger scientist, um, and you just know for myself that you're so taught into being exact on how you describe things. Like, so it's. It goes against your nature, and it's not because you want to put people down. It's just that it's so hard, sort of, to to say the wrong word because you're taught, in, you know, so like it's imprinted in you that you have to be correct. So practicing how to be more general so that you can actually get the message through is really, really hard. And it's not about not trying. It's just, you know, like. I know like how difficult it's been for me to, to explain sort of what I did for my PhD. Uh, because you don't want to, like, usually you just, like, give up because nobody's going to just gonna think it's boring or just, you know, so... I, 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 do, I do agree with that. Uh, I think that many of those things that I talked about now is not done to be um, superior, to be, to, but, but it's sometimes, that's what I was just, I was just trying to give you, an inside view, uh, that's what uh, you're going to be viewed as. I have had very, very many good science communications as well. Maybe I should have given you some examples of that as well. I thought it would be more entertaining if I didn't. Uh, but but uh, you are right, and that is one of the dif big differences between scientists and journalists are that uh, we after working with this for so many, many years, I understood that the reason why you're recommending a colleague is not that you don't want to participate, it's that you believe that your hier hi hierarchy is so big. It's so much of a difference between being a professor and a, a PhD student. And if you as a PhD student kind of takes too much um, room, it's, it's not good for your scientific career. Uh, so I understand why it's done. Still, the effect is the same. I would just like, I don't think that people do this to be mean or nasty. It's just the difference between how different system works. For us, we don't have any high hierarchy. I am the editor and I'm also the reporter. Uh, and for us, it doesn't matter. It's usually a good thing to have the professor because they are more self-assured uh, and they are very confident, so it works. But um, I'm sorry if you get that message that I really hate scientists. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I think that uh, we have done a lot of really great stories with scientists uh, and learned from it from both ways. Uh, in the quick m news communication, it's, it's easier if you know the ground rules. Uh, but I don't expect that everyone should know about this. This happens every day. It's just, I thought it could be interesting to you to, to, to hear about 
what kind of, of problems you might run into. Uh, and uh, also the credit thing is for you if you if you don't give the correct references that's even fraud if you if you kind of give yourself credit and there's somebody else who did the work uh, that's really bad for a scientist to do uh, and if you're caught doing that that could be really bad for your career but keep in mind when you're participating in, in the media there are different rules that's not the time to give credit you give credit in your scientific papers uh, and I think sometimes you kind of need to understand that you're stepping out of your arena. Uh, and this is a different arena. I am stepping out of my arena right now. I'm meeting you here. And every time I go to Karolinska Institute, I'm in somebody else's arena. Uh, and it's important to understand that they are different and there are different rules. But I, I agree. Uh, uh, I wouldn't like to talk about epigenetics to someone who doesn't know anything about it. It's really, really, where do you start? I did a 25-minute story on epigenetics once. It took me forever to write. I had a lot of help from researchers and scientists, and it turned out OK. Um, <coughs> my, my general advice in there is to think that when you talk to journalists, it doesn't matter their science background. You're not talking to them. You're talking to a big audience. You're talking to your neighbor. You're talking to the kids. Maybe not the five-year-olds, but the 14-year-olds. So what I d recommend people to do is to practice. Explain to your neighbor, what do you do? And see when they are starting to understand. Then that's the correct mode. But I must say also that Victoria is like amazing. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. She's been ill, but she's, she will be back Friday, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Would you prefer that a scientist, when they choose them, speak to them sort of as concrete as possible, or would you prefer them using metaphors and similes? That is a difficult question. Uh, it depends on how difficult your subject is. Epigenetics, for example, is, is really very difficult if you, if you don't use me metaphors, because you don't understand what's the purpose of this. Scientists don't understand it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but sometimes if you give too many metaphors, I remember, for example, with the telomeras and telomeres, to remember, there were so many metaphors that you kind of got lost in the metaphors. I still don't understand those. And I did 20 minutes on, on it on television. <coughs> was it like this, this, this tip of the shoelace, or, or was it not? As it turns out, that's a wrong metaphor. So you should be careful with metaphors, but if you have a good one, use it. Hmm? Yeah. They're not so good with each other I mean, in the scientific field of the experience. As they say, they're good people and bad people, and uh, they, they can be in a different hierarchy. Uh, and uh, communication is not necessarily good for the one on top or the one in the middle, or it's random problem. Yeah. But, uh, uh, then, this is how we see the media. We used to have this belief that. Everything can be seen from the satellite. And at the moment, uh, we, we know about a plane, a huge device that is lost somewhere. And mm. I've been feeding myself up of this uh, knowledge, and nobody knows where it is. And so mm. I know my field. I'm very into mm. these words, and I don't know anything about, I mean, general things mm. about other things. Then I, I have been misled to believe that you have a mobile phone, you they know where you are. Mm. They don't know where the plane of the kind of meters is. So this is the, the problem, I, I think. I think that in general, uh, people that want to go into science are interested to be more specific, and you like to work in your own field. <laughs> and the whole idea about communicating with media, the sloppy, illiterate, uh, har uh, people in a hurry is not that compelling. You don't really like to meet those kind of people because you like that specialty. And we really do need people that like to be specific like that. Um, the whole mm. trick is to just take the best of each other's knowledge and kind of mix it. And then you might understand where the plane is one day. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why they can't find that plane. I had a colleague who wrote an article about that, but I didn't understand it after reading the article either. So, uh, <laughs> hmm? Any more questions? 
I, I, I'm just uh, wondering if, if you're working in a very <coughs> interesting field, you think, uh, and you, it's not been communicated, and you, it's like you want to give a tip. Do you have do you have some recommendation on how to do that, or or is it just not worth it, or how, how can you if you work in some with something interesting, how can you spread it? First of all, when the journalists do call, talk. if the journalist doesn't call, okay, uh, <laughs> then it's difficult, perhaps. <laughs> I, I think that you should look at television and maybe listen to the radio. Radio has also uh, and science. I think it's better to contact science reporters in general uh, because um, this kind of goes against what I just said, but uh, <coughs> they are. Uh, they might be not, not be experts, but at least they know that stem cells are something that really makes a difference. They have a general interest in what you do. So you should look and find your favorite reporter and call that person. Probably not call the editors, because I get so extremely many calls. Uh, and I get so much press information. Karolinska Institute has a real good press. Uh, they have an embargo system that you get beforehand news which is a good idea, but most of you don't have that possibility. So before, if you know that you have a big publication coming up in science, you can call a, a reporter and ask your information to be embargoed so they don't use that before the publication. That I would do. If I would have a science publication, I would figure out science or nature or cell or British Medical Journal. Uh, well, maybe if I had an important uh, publication coming up anyway, I would call a specific journalist and say, "But this is coming up, but you cannot talk about it, but you can prepare a story. So when this is coming up, you will be first. And then that could be a good way to get your, if you do have a publication coming up. Sometimes you don't even have that. And then it's much more difficult. But it's a good way to, uh, I think that you, in general, you should look for people, not organizations. Do not send a message to the newsroom at Swedish television, for example, because they are completely getting drowned in those kind of things. It's, it's I think, like most kind of communications, you should get to know people on a more one-to-one -one basis. That would be my advice. And if you do have publications, please also contact, contact the press office. At <laughs> <laughs> they can help you out. Uh, okay, thank you very much for this, Malin. And mm -hmm. applause. Yeah, this is a small present. <laughs>